Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. In the long history of the Seven Kingdoms, there have been very few women who have been able to claim power that rivals the lords, and even fewer who have actually risen to become queen in their own right. You would actually be forgiven for thinking that House Targaryen is the only noble family with historically strong women, because much of Westerosi history is clouded in the fog of mystery. But there have been a few instances where a queen has, or aspired to, rule from atop the Iron Throne. In the main series, that queen is Daenerys Targaryen, and while while she literally falls short of fulfilling her dream in the show, that remains to be seen in Martin's books. Dracarys. Queen Rhaenys and Queen Visenya, Aegon the Conqueror's sister wives, sat the throne in his absence, but they weren't exactly high queens in their own right. Only one woman has canonically sat the Iron Throne, and that woman is Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen, the realm's delight, rider of Cyrax, and mother of kings. The legacy of the only official High Queen of Westeros is a complex and blood-soaked tale of treachery and tragedy, fire and blood. So, without further ado, let's dive right into her origins. And spoiler warning before you proceed, because there will be a lot of those in this video. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Seven Kingdoms saw only one official High Queen before the arrival of the Targaryens. A world of ice and fire and fire and blood tried to give us a proper history of the Seven Kingdoms, but as is the case with our own world, much of it is lost to time. Though we do know that many great houses have been ruling their domains for thousands of years, we don't know their exact lineages, how many battles they'd fought, who married with who and who sat the throne when except in a few cases. And we most certainly do not hear tales of women rising to that position, at least not in the Western we know of. It cannot be ascertained when the wildlings, sorry, free folk, ventured out beyond the wall or if they were living there since the time the first men invaded, but their culture has more equality in it than of the kneelers down south. The free folk have a story tradition of women warriors fighting beside their men. These fierce spearwives could even rise to the rank of clan mother, although that was a position that any woman with sufficient capabilities could aspire to as well. In the main story, we know of Harmed Dog's Head and Mother Mole as being leaders of their own clans of wildlings with the latter turning into a prophetic figure for them when they seek shelter at Hardhome. But every time the free folk have tried to force a crossing of the wall, it's been under a king, not a queen. So it is for the kingdoms down south as well. A world of ice and fire makes note of only two queens before the arrival of the Roinar from the east, and even then we'd be hard-pressed to call one of them queen. The first was presumably a woman from House Gardener, because the histories of the Reach state that their ancient kingdom was ruled by the kings of the Reach, and in one instance, queen of the Reach. It's possible that this queen could have been from another noble family, House Hightower immediately springs to our minds, but she is the only ruling High Queen in Westeros whose reign made it to their history books. If there were others, we'd not be able to say. As for the second queen we just referenced, well, that's another matter entirely. Before the Andals arrived, the first men and the children of the forest lived in the era of the Pact, but war was still in the nature of humanity and they didn't attempt to get rid of it. During the reign of King Durwald Durandon, also remembered as Durwald the Fat, the Storm Kings of old reached a historic low point. It was said that his kingdom could be measured by the distance that a man's piss reached from the walls of Storm's End, and though he reigned for a long time, he faced many rebellions, including one from from an enigmatic woods witch. She called herself the Green Queen and held the Rainwood in Cape Wrath, in defiance of Durwal's rule for the better part of his reign. Though this woman could have had noble blood in her veins, it's more likely that she was one of the children and wanted to reclaim her lost land from a king who was clearly weaker than his predecessors. These are the only two women we hear of leading any kind of kingdom, and interestingly enough, they all come from the south, where the maesters can collect information more freely. Of course, the legends speak of the corpse queen of the Night's King, who ruled beside him at the wall for 13 years before they were deposed by the King of Winter and the King beyond the Wall. But legends don't fit into our descriptor here, so we'll not get into that right now. Things are different across the Narrow Sea, where the role and rule of women was given as much importance as that of men. The most prominent example of this is in the civilization of the Roinar, where men and women hold equal ruling rights and inheritance is purely based on primogeniture. When the Valyrian Freehold turned its eye towards their watery principalities, it was only the wisdom of Princess Nymeria that ensured 
ensured the survival of their people. After the disastrous Second Spice War, Nymeria gathered her people on 10,000 ships and fled Essos, traveling to Zamitar on Sothyros first and then the Summer Isles before finally arriving at the Greenblood River in Dawn. There, she married Mors Martel and started a war that united all of the Red Sands of Dawn under the newly created Principality of Dawn, ruled over by House Nymeros Martel. Though Nymeria would take two more husbands after Mors, she would remain the de facto ruler for 27 years and upon her death, the throne of Sanspear passed to her eldest living heir, a daughter. Since Nymeria's war, the Dornish customs have become more Roynish, and many houses have allowed primogeniture to rule over gender. But because Dawn is a principality and the Roynar had a city-state-centric political system, none could ever claim to be queen. That almost changed in the centuries leading up to Aegon's conquest. Over 400 years before the Conqueror was crowned, the Riverlands were a political hotbed with dozens of houses vying for power and kinship over its fertile lands and rivers. House Teague was the ruling family at the time, and theirs was a dynasty not overly loved by the Rivermen. Their founder was an adventurer of uncertain birth who won his crown with swords and was forced to keep hostages to maintain his power. The last Teague king, Humphrey I, made matters worse when his piety caused him to build multiple septs and mother houses and repress the worship of the old gods. In in response, the river lords who kept the old gods rose up and rebelled. Foremost amongst them were the Blackwoods, who had been exiled from the north thousands of years ago and yet had been river kings in more ancient times. Despite putting on an impressive effort with a smaller army, the Blackwoods were nearly defeated in battle until their in-laws showed up. The Storm King Arlen Durandon III had married into the Blackwood family, taking his wedding vows in front of their greatest weirwood tree, which now stands poisoned and stunted. He answered his father-in-law's call and came to the Riverlands with his knights to drive out the Sellsword Kings. The Battle of the Six Kings at was called, for Humphrey and his four successors each briefly reigned as River King before being slaughtered by the Storm King's forces. After Arlen's men had secured the Riverlands, there was a bit of a quandary. The Blackwoods, on whose side they had entered the battle, had no capable male heir worthy of inheriting the throne of the Trident. The oldest one was an eight-year-old boy. Arlen then turned to his father-in-law's daughters, but here he was met with opposition by the Riverlords. Lady Shearer Blackwood could have become Queen Shearer Blackwood of the Trident had they not ardently protested her appointment on account of her sex, and Arlen, finding no other way to keep the Riverlands united, decided to annex the territory to his own kingdom. But Arlen's conquest was not as secure as you might think. In the years following the planting of the Jorindon Banner at the shores of the Sunset Sea, the Storm Lords faced many rebellions from their Rivermen counterparts. At least eight different people tried to claim the title of River King and King of the Trident, and one of them was a woman. Her name was Jane Nutt, and she was the only woman known to have proclaimed herself River Queen and Queen of the Trident. Though her reign was brief and inglorious, according to a world of ice and fire, she was the first woman in the annals of history to be named as a High Queen. The Riverlands would eventually fall under the dominion of House Hor of the Iron Islands, which is how Aegon the Conqueror would find them when he began his westward conquest. During Aegon's wars, two queens rose up and were deposed just as quickly. Let's talk about Argella Jorindon first. Daughter of the last Storm King Argelac the Arrogant, Argella can be considered the starting point of Aegon's conquest or her marriage more accurately. Lord Aegon Targaryen received an offer of a marriage alliance between himself and Argelac, through which Aegon could have claimed a kingdom of his own. But the lands the Storm King offered him were lost by Arik Durandon long ago, and Aegon was well aware of that fact. He countered the proposal by asking for more lands and promising Oris Baratheon's hand to Argella instead, as he was already married by this point, but since Oris was purportedly his bastard half-brother, Argelac took this as an insult. He cut the messenger whose hand brought him Aegon's proposal and sent them back to him, thus sealing his own fate. Argelac Durandon fell during the last storm, when Rhaenys and Oris smashed the Durandon hosts near Bronzegate. Argella Durandon declared herself Storm Queen after this and held Storm's End in defiance of the Targaryen host, but her own men turned against her and served her up to Oris. He honored her instead and took her for his own wife, thus creating House Baratheon, Lord Paramount of the Stormlands. The second queen rose further north than Shipbreaker Bay. The sistermen had a black and free history, but had agreed to pay homage to the Arryns after they'd been savaged by the Stark. 
Starks. When the Targaryens arrived, they saw a chance to go back to their old ways and rebelled, raising Lady Marla Sunderland to the post of Queen. She reigned over the three sisters until Todd and Stark bent the knee to Aegon the Conqueror, after which her kingdom was put down and Marla herself was turned into a silent sister. Thus, it can be said that the history of the Seven Kingdoms was sorely devoid of any proper ruling queens until the Conqueror's Three created the Iron Throne. Only three women have ever sat atop Aegon's monstrosity and ruled with power comparable or outright equivalent to that of the king, and two of those were the Conqueror's sister wives. Visenya and Rhaenys were a part of all of Aegon's wars and councils, and would often sit the Iron Throne when their brother was away on one of his numerous progresses through the realm. No queen following the Conqueror's wives has held as much influence in court and council besides perhaps Alisan Targaryen. The good queen never sat the Iron Throne, but supported her husband Jaehaerys in court, council, and cot. She gave birth to thirteen children and arranged multiple marriages in the realm, gave the Night's Watch new lands, and reformed many Westerosi laws and customs. But she never sat the throne like her husband or her predecessors, and her final years were filled with bitterness, grief, and separation. Queen Alisan Targaryen is rightfully remembered as an outstanding queen consort, but the fact that she was not a ruling high queen in her own right might have been the cause for much grief for House Targaryen, for, like Nymeria before her, she too preferred pure primogeniture over traditional male inheritance. Twice did Alisan fight for the rights of the eldest daughter to inherit over the younger son, first for her firstborn daughter Daenerys, whom Jaehaerys refused to name heir to the Iron Throne, and then for her granddaughter Rhaenys, who was passed over in favor of her uncle Balon, despite being the Prince of Dragonstone's only living heir. The darling of the realm would not live long enough to even fight for her claim as Prince as Daenerys passed away at the age of seven due to the shivers, and the story of the queen who never was is something you can find on our channel. But there is one woman who achieved all that Jaehaerys denied Alysan, and then some. Like Rhaenys, she too was the only daughter of a royal prince, and like Daenerys, she was not acknowledged as a possible heir for a long time. But that is where Rhaenyra Targaryen's story diverges from her predecessors, because unlike them, she can claim to have ruled as a high queen from atop the Iron Throne in her own right. And though the maesters don't recognize her reign officially, thanks to medieval sexism and the citadel's pronounced high tower bias, we will now begin documenting the reign of the realm's delight, or as she was remembered towards the end, King Magor with teats. I bought you something. She was born after her second husband had turned 16, Rhaenyra Targaryen's birth and early years. The year 97 AC was both celebratory and capricious for the family of Crown Prince Balon Targaryen. His second son, Daemon, had impressed his grandsire with his skill at arms so much that he was knighted at 16 and given the Valyrian steel sword Dark Sister to bear in battle. On the other hand, Daemon had also been married to Lady Rhea Royce of Runestone. Balon's second son was a 16-year-old prince who had just proven himself a great warrior and yet was now being packed off to the historically non-belligerent Vale of Arryn. While things might have been split 50-50 down the middle for the rogue prince, little did he know that the niece he welcomed into the world that year would go on to become so integral to his own life. Rhaenyra Targaryen was born in 97 AC as the only child of Prince Viserys Targaryen and Lady Emma Arryn to survive past the cradle. The princess had an impeccable lineage on both sides of her family. Her maternal grandfather was Lord Roderick Arryn, who had served the Old King as Master of Laws and was descended from the line of the Sky Kings of old. Her maternal grandmother was a Targaryen herself, the Princess Dela Targaryen, whom Alysanne referred to as her little flower. Rhaenyra's grandsire and grandmother on her parents' side were the brave Prince Balon Targaryen and his late wife Elisa. Both fiery and fearless in their day, and her grandsire was actually the Prince of Dragonstone at her birth, which gave her a modicum of acclaim to the Iron Throne, though it would most likely be dismissed on account of her sex. Rhaenyra's father, Viserys, was Balon's eldest son, and since Balon had been named the heir to the Iron Throne, which meant Viserys would inherit after him. But the succession wasn't on the prince's mind so much as the welfare and continued survival of his daughter was. For Emma Arryn, though healthy enough, had suffered multiple miscarriages in the lead-up to Rhaenyra's birth. One of her children, a boy, made it to the cradle, but didn't make it any further than that. As a result, the prince and his wife doted on their daughter, and there are no reports of them having tried to create another child with each other, either. Rhaenyra was a fourth-generation Targaryen at the time of her birth, since Jaehaerys and Alysanne were both alive at the time. She grew up to be a proud and stubborn girl, with a certain petulance to her small mouth, according to Harchmaester Gildane. The princess favoured rich dresses that reflected her regal status, wearing purple and gold more often than not. As a child, her every whim was indulged by her parents, and she had the free-flowing beauty of a true Targaryen. 
silver gold hair, purple eyes, and a charming personality. When she was four years old, Rhaenyra's father won the Great Council of 101 AC and was named Prince of Dragonstone, following her grandfather Balon's death. Two years later, her great-grandsire Jaehaerys passed away as well, and Viserys Targaryen ascended the Iron Throne as king. Because Rhaenyra was a girl, and the claims of Lena Valerian and Princess Rhaenys Targaryen had all but been ignored at the Great Council, no one expected Viserys to name her as his heir. But the king went a step further and made no mention of who would succeed him. He put off that matter until a son was born to him, and this made his brother Daemon Targaryen realize that he was the heir presumptive until such a time did come by. Rhaenyra's mother had always been a frail woman, and after suffering multiple birthing mishaps, she barely made it out of her own. Viserys didn't try to make another child with her after Rhaenyra because he never thought he would need one. Now that he was king, he realized that his realm needed a true male heir, and decided to give them one with his wife. But he didn't realize that the child he did have was already enamored by his own brother. Prince Daemon Targaryen had spent most of his time in the Vale of Arryn following Rhaenyra's birth, and it was only after Viserys became king that he was allowed back at court. When he was, his niece became enamored with him, and Daemon, who must have been aware of this, would indulge her, much like her parents. He'd bring her exotic gifts from his trips across the narrow sea, and it is likely that he encouraged her to take a dragon of her own because that was the same year Rhaenyra bonded with the hatchling Cyrax. The beautiful yellow she-dragon was named after a Valyrian goddess by the princess herself, and was treated much like her, too. Cyrax grew into a huge and formidable dragon, and was more than capable of flying over great distances, but she wasn't a fighter. In fact, she wasn't even a hunter, and was mostly fed by the dragon keepers. By the time the Dance of the Dragons came about, she hadn't hunted in years. This is reflective of Rhaenyra's personality as well, for much like the princess, her dragon too was indulged in all things. But it is here that we must take a moment to talk about Rhaenyra and her uncle Daemon and their relationship. Emma Darcy, who plays the former, has described it as a grooming situation, and we couldn't agree more. Even the fragmentary accounts put down by Archmaester Gildane suggest that the rogue prince had his eyes on his niece rather early on. Why else would he be giving her exotic gifts at such a young age? It is said that Rhaenyra was enamored by her uncle, and the rogue prince certainly was dashing as only a pure-blooded Targaryen could be, but surely it must have been encouraged by his gifts as well, no? So we see that Rhaenyra started getting attention from people quite early on and was used to getting it sustainably. Perhaps this contributed to her petulance, which can also be translated as bluntness in the face of men, nobles and commoners alike. Don't forget that all the information we have on her comes from the maesters of the Citadel, who are suspected of having an anti-Targaryen agenda and are known to have a patriarchal point of view. But getting back to Rhaenyra's story, it took an interesting turn in the year after her father's official ascension, though that year itself was not without intrigue. At the age of seven, Prince Viserys had doted on his daughter, but at eight, he made her a part of his council as well. He appointed Rhaenyra as his official cupbearer, and thereafter the princess was seldom seen without the king. She would serve him at table, tourney, and court, and it was at the second of those things where she met her second great crush of her youth. In 104 AC, King Viserys Targaryen, first of his name, arranged a grand tourney at Maidenpool to celebrate his ascension. His grace's reign would be mocked by many such tourneys and feasts and balls and masks, for the king was fond of celebration and indulgence. Many champions gathered to fight at this tourney, including members of the King's Guard, Prince Damon himself, and a relatively unknown household knight from the Dornish marches. His skill at arms could not be doubted, for he defeated the rogue prince himself in the final of the melee, knocking Dark's sister from his hand with his morning star. But it was likely his coal black hair and pale green eyes that made the princess smitten with him. He gave her his victor's laurel, and she returned the gesture in kind, giving him her favor to wear in the joust. There, Sir Criston Cole and Horse Damon again, as well as the Cargill twins of the Kingsguard, before being unhorsed by Lord Lymond Malister of Seaguard. Though he might have lost the joust, he won the heart of Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen, for she begged her father to name him her sworn shield, and King Viserys, as in other cases, obliged his daughter. When the legendary Sir Ryan Redwine died in 105 AC, Cole replaced him in the King's Guard, and thereafter Rhaenyra took to calling him her White Knight. He would protect the princess during public events and always wear her favor in the list thereafter. So already you can see that there were two men who would become the objects of Rhaenyra's fancy, and perhaps they might have fought one another over her as well had the circumstances allowed. But then Prince Daemon Targaryen went ahead and made the most insensitive comment he possibly could about the brother of the very niece he once brought gifts to. A king must have an heir. It 
it is ancient custom and common knowledge in a monarchy to secure the line of succession as soon as possible. Though Rhaenyra was Viserys' eldest living child, the precedents of the Great Council made it very clear that the throne could only pass to a male heir. So Viserys first tried to honor the decisions that got him elected king in the first place. In 105 AC, Queen Emma Arryn announced her pregnancy to the court. It must have been both a delight and terror to the people, for at the time, Emma had not seen the birthing bed for eight years, and Rhaenyra had already lost one brother in the cradle and many others to miscarriages. So when the queen went into labor, the world held its breath. Many rejoiced at first when she finally delivered the son who would have secured the realm, but Queen Emma herself had died as the maesters had to cut her open for the delivery, and in hindsight, that should have been the first sign of the upcoming civil war. The son Emma delivered, a boy Viserys named Balon after his own father, did not outlive her long. He died the next day, and mother and son were cremated together. We're not told how this made the princess feel, but we know how it made her uncle feel, and we certainly know how it influenced the thinking of the king. Let's get to Damon first. The rogue prince was observed making drunken japes about the heir for a day at the Street of Silk after Prince Balon and Queen Emma's funeral, and for this insensitivity, he was banished back to the Vale by his brother. We aren't told how Rhaenyra reacted to this either, but we can't imagine her being okay with her uncle's comments. But Damon's words did make something very clear to her, and Viserys as well. The question of succession had been left wide open after after Emma's death, where he could have kept him silent with posts and honors before, Viserys found the question of dealing with his brother more pressing now than ever. Damon's leadership of the City Watch had been effective, yet brutal, and the biggest opponent of the king's brother was the king's hand. Both Otto Hightower and Damon Targaryen were similar people, second sons who had to carve their own paths to glory, and as a result they resented each other for they knew each other's true motives without having to speak a word. So when Damon made the mistake of joking about Viserys' late son, Otto seized upon the opportunity and proposed an heir of his own, he put forth the idea of naming Rhaenyra the Princess of Dragonstone. I swear toward the Queen. The Princess and the Queen, Rhaenyra Targaryen's minority and majority as the official heir to the Iron Throne. In late 105 AC, King Viserys Targaryen gathered all the lords of his realm in the throne room of the Red Keep and had them swear a solemn oath. Though the Great Council of 101 AC had established an iron precedent for succession, seeing as the king was without a male heir, he was going to create a new tradition of his own. In front of the eyes of thousands of lords and ladies, high and low alike, Viserys declared Rhaenyra the Princess of Dragonstone and heir to the Iron Throne. Everyone summoned was commanded to swear fealty to her and pledged to defend her honor and rights when she came into her inheritance. Thus did the young king make his greatest proclamation and his greatest disaster in one fell swoop. Notably absent from the ceremony was his brother Daemon, who had occupied Dragonstone with Caraxes and his paramour Missaria. But everyone of note within the realm, even the High Towers, bent the knee to her that day and swore to see her seated upon the throne after her father's passing. That was the same year that Lord Lionel Strong brought his sons Laris and Harwin to court with him. And though this is not important now, it will become later. Rhaenyra spent the initial days of being named the official heiress, lavished by attention from all, especially her father the king. But the year after her appointment, the princess was faced with the biggest obstacle to her inheritance in the form of a brand new queen. King Viserys Targaryen must have known that he couldn't possibly have another child when he named Rhaenyra his heir, but he could not have known that he would fall in love again, let alone marry. Alicent Hightower, the daughter of the Hand of the King, was taken by Viserys as his second wife in 106 AC, and it seemed as though relations between stepmother and stepdaughter would remain cordial. The Lady Alicent had been at court since the days of King Jaehaerys when she was his constant companion, but had stayed after the old king's passing. She was nine years older than Rhaenyra, and some whispered that her father had brought her to the capital with the intention of marrying her to Jaehaerys following Alisan's death. If that was true, then it appeared as though Otto had shifted his target from the grandsire to the grandson. But Emma Arryn's body had not been cremated for even a year when Viserys married again. Rhaenyra must have known Alicent in her years growing up, and though there was no special warmth between them, the princess was willing to kindle those fires with her. Being the king's cupbearer, it was Princess Rhaenyra who poured for Queen Alicent at her wedding feast, and for her part, the Hightower girl kissed her and called her daughter. Things remained amenable between the two, right up until Alicent gave birth to her first child, a healthy boy whom she named Aegon, after the conqueror himself. Aegon's birth in 107 AC was followed by Helena's in 109 
109 AC and Amon's in 110 AC. Just like that, Rhaenyra found herself competing with her half-siblings over something she grew up expecting to be hers and hers alone. Rhaenyra Targaryen always took care to refer to her half-siblings as half-brothers or half-sister. All affection between the princess and the queen broke down after Alicent birthed sons, but once they had come into this world, she insisted on having them inherit the Iron Throne as opposed to Rhaenyra. In this, she was backed by her father Otto Hightower, and before long, the Hightower conspiracy was plain for King Viserys to see. His hand and his queen wanted their own blood on the throne, and three children deep into the marriage it would be hard to procure an annulment. So he dismissed Otto as his hand, giving his post to the able and unbiased master of laws Lionel Strong instead, and refused to change the line of succession no matter how hard Alicent pressed him. As far as the king was concerned, he had settled the succession when he named Rhaenyra princess of Dragonstone, and he was determined to make a lasting peace within his own house, like the one his grandsire had given to the realm. But in that, he was the only man who died, believing he had succeeded. Though the princess and the queen would be all false smiles and empty courtesies in front of the king for his sake, behind his back their feuds would continue unimpeded. Two distinct parties began forming up and were named after the celebrations that were held in honor of Viserys and Alicent's fifth anniversary. The queen arrived to the opening feasts in a beautiful green gown, the same color as the beacon of the High Tower when Old Town calls its banners to war. The princess dressed dramatically in Targaryen red and black. Thereafter, their parties were not called the Queen's Party or the Princess's Party, but the Greens and the Blacks. At that tourney, Rhaenyra's champion, Kristen Cole, unhorsed all of Queen Alicent's champions, including her brother, Sir Gwain Hightower but her white knight was upstaged by the returned rogue prince. Daemon Targaryen interrupted the tourney with Caraxes, donning the crown that the sea snake put upon his brow in the stepstones. He offered it up now to his brother, King Viserys, and just like that, Balon's sons were reunited once again. And just like that, uncle and niece began getting closer once again. In 111 AC, Rhaenyra Targaryen was a maid of 14, flowered and beautiful as only a Valerian could be. Her uncle declared her the fairest maiden in all the Seven Kingdoms upon his return. For six months, Daemon Targaryen courted his niece in all but name, taking her hawking and flying with him, their dragons Caraxes and Cyrax racing to Dragonstone and back with one another. He gave her pearls, silks, and a jade tiara that had once belonged to the Empress of Lang. Daemon lavished praise on her and mocked Alicent and her sons, which could only have made him dearer to his niece, the Princess of Dragonstone, but then Daemon stepped too far. Accounts differ as to what transpired between the two of them. Grand Maester Runcita's official records only note that the two brothers quarreled but Septon Eustace and the court fool Mushroom's testimonies make one thing clear. Something physical went down between the two of them. Septon Eustace plainly states that Daemon seduced Rhaenyra. He claims that the two were found abed by Sir Arik Cargill of the Kingsguard and that the princess was in love with her uncle. Mushroom, on the other hand, claims that Rhaenyra was in love, but not with Daemon. She loved Sir Kristen Cole, and Daemon only taught her the womanly art she would require to seduce him. When Rhaenyra approached Kristen, however, he spurned her. Mushroom's testimony is a little less believable given the fact that he included himself in Daemon's lessons to Rhaenyra as well. But something did happen between Daemon and Rhaenyra, for the king banished his brother from the capital a second time and began earnestly searching for a suitable prince consort for his daughter. We have no word on how Rhaenyra reacted to all this, but she couldn't have been pleased for she rejected every suitor for raided in front of her throughout 112 AC. The sons of Lord Blackwood and Bracken fought a duel over her at the Trident, and the Lannister twins Jason and Tylan tried to woo her at Casterly Rock. The fool Frey asked her for her hand outright, and Rhaenyra also entertained proposals from Oakhearts, Tarleys, Tullys and Tyrells. Sir Harwin Strong, the son of the Hand of the King and the captain in the Gold Cloaks, paid suit to the princess in King's Landing while Viserys himself pondered a match with Prince Corin Martell to finally bring Dawn into the fold. Rhaenyra rejected all comers, or let them linger for so long that her father became frustrated with her and forced her to choose a husband by the end of 113 AC. While Viserys was proverbially tearing his hair out at his daughter's stubbornness, his wife came up with an unexpected solution. She proposed a betrothal between Rhaenyra and her eldest son, Aegon. This marriage would have united the splintered branches of House Targaryen and seen two members of the royal family rule together once again, something that hadn't happened since the time of King Jaehaerys. But there were problems. The two half-siblings had never gotten along with one another well. Then there was their age gap to consider. Aegon was just six years old, 
where Rhaenyra was 16. Viserys had rejected a match between himself and Lena Valerian for the very reason of an age gap. And finally, by the time 113 AC had come around, the king had wisened up to his wife's true ambitions. When asked about his wife's efforts to get Rhaenyra disinherited or married to Aegon, Viserys replied that the boy was her own blood and she wanted to see him sit the throne. So it was that upon her 16th name day, Rhaenyra Targaryen officially took possession of her designated seat and title, becoming the first princess of Dragonstone and her small council had finally agreed upon a perfect match for her. King Viserys had decided to right the wrongs of his reign and that of his grandsire before him by sealing the rift between House Targaryen and House Valerian, and had chosen Leonor Valerian for his daughter's prince consort. All of Viserys' political reasoning was perfectly sound, but he had not considered one thing. His daughter was not the kind to marry for politics. Grand Maester Melos had infamously remarked that Leonor's sexual preferences made no matter, for he himself did not like fish, but when he was served fish, he would eat it. He had forgotten that he was a man of wisdom and knowledge and Rhaenyra was a royal princess. When the matter was broached with her, Rhaenyra is recalled to have remarked that her half-brothers would be more to Leonor's tastes, and Archmaester Gildane notes that it was only after the king threatened her post that she relented to the match. And it must have been after this that relations between the princess and her white knight broke down, for it is known that by the time Rhaenyra's wedding celebrations began, Kristen Cole was firmly entrenched in Alicent Hightower's camp. Septon Eustace claims that after hearing of Rhaenyra's Rhaenyra's betrothal, Kristen Cole slipped into her apartments and begged her to run away with him. He offered her his own hand in marriage and wanted to take her across the narrow sea to live and die with her as a free man. Rhaenyra refused, however, stating that if he could break his king's guard vows, he could break his marriage vows as well. And besides, a queen was meant for more. Mushroom claims it had been the other way around, that Rhaenyra approached Cole in White Sword Tower and was spurned by him once again. Desperate and desolate, she found comfort in the arms of Sir Harwin Strong, and was found abed with him the next morning by Mushroom himself. Once again, we cannot ascertain which of these tales is true, except for the fact that after Rhaenyra was betrothed to Leonor, Kristen broke his ties with her and went over to the Greens. At her wedding tourney, the Lord Commander went berserk at the melee and cracked Sir Joffrey Lonmouth's skull with his morning star, before literally breaking the bones of Sir Harwin Breakbones, who wore Rhaenyra's favour at the tourney. After this instance, Kristen became Alicent's sworn shield and Harwin became Rhaenyra's foremost supporter. In hindsight, the violence that occurred at the royal wedding should have been the first indicator to all observers at court that war was becoming inevitable by the day. But if they did not take notice then, they certainly did once Rhaenyra started producing heirs of her own. If we are to serve the Seven Kingdoms, we must answer to their gods. The Black Princess and the Mother of Strongs and Dragons Rhaenyra Targaryen in the lead-up to the dance. Following her marriage to Sir Leonor, who was knighted a fortnight before his wedding, presumably because anything less than a knight would not be a worthy prince consort for Rhaenyra, the royal couple would stay apart from one another. The Princess of Dragonstone remained at court while Sir Leonor remained at high tide with his comely knights and retainers. So it was suspicious that a prince consort who was barely around his wife got her with child in the first year of their marriage. But the birth of Prince Gisarys Valerian was cause for both celebration and concern. On one hand, the succession was securer than it had been before, and Jace was a healthy and lusty lad. On the other hand, he looked exactly like Rhaenyra's sworn shield, and nothing like either of his Valyrian parents. Jace and his brothers Luke and Joff all had the brown eyes and hair and the pug nose of Sir Harwin Strong, yet for one reason or the other, the king never acknowledged the naked treason in front of his eyes. Rhaenyra's sons were clearly bastards with no claim to the Iron Throne, but Viserys once told Jace that the Iron Throne would be his one day in front of his royal court, and even encouraged closeness between him and his newly born uncle Daron by naming them Milk Brothers. It didn't work. When Luke came into the world in 115 AC, his birth became the catalyst of Rhaenyra's departure from the capital altogether. Allegedly, she was attended by both her husband and her lover for the birth, and following Luke's arrival, Rhaenyra removed herself to her own seat at Dragonstone. It was there that she gave birth to her third son, Joffrey, but by that time, the damage had been done. Queen Alicent Hightower had taken more than a passing note of the sheer dissimilarity in appearance that the royal princes had with regards to their named parents, and she began to wonder out loud if they were Leonor's children at all. At Luke's birth, she publicly told Sir Leonor to keep trying, as he might get one that looks like him sooner or later. And after that cat had been let out of the bag, Rhaenyra didn't exactly have a choice but to leave, did she? Though her decision got the heat off her back in the immediate setting, it was a disastrous tactical decision for the king and his council were now firmly in the hands of the Greens. Rhaenyra was still a part of Viserys' political deliberations 
being his designated heir, but she held far less personal sway over him now that she was dividing her time between two places. And soon two became three, because her uncle Damon decided to marry into her family by law as well taking Lena's elder sister, Lena, to wife. Rhaenyra loved her good sister as much as she hated her stepmother and would go flying with her often upon the dragons. Damon and Lena became so close to Rhaenyra that when Jace was only four years old, she betrothed him and Luke to Damon and Lena's twins, Bela and Rhaena, with the blessing of her father, the king. These were perhaps the golden years of the princess of Dragonstone's life, for she had a thriving household, was surrounded by the people she loved and had more or less a secure grasp on her inheritance. But it is said that the next generation always inherits everything that their parents have to give to them, including their hate. And that was true for the children of Rhaenyra Targaryen and Alicent Hightower. The six princes were often forced to spend time with one another by their grandsire the king in the hope that it would somehow fix their relationship when all it served to do was drive the wedge in deeper. Rhaenyra's blissful life at Dragonstone was built upon thin ice, and it cracked in 120 AC when the Red Spring came for her loved ones. The first to pass was Lena Valerian. Rhaenyra's good sister died trying to give birth to her uncle's third child, a twisted and malformed stillborn babe, and she stood vigil over her body with Damon. Then her own husband died after a rather suspiciously timed quarrel with his companion slash lover, Sir Carl Corrie and Rhaenyra's parents by law were consumed by grief. Lord Corlys and Princess Rhaenys had lost both their children in the same year, and the second one seemingly to a cat's paw, for a rumor began to spread that Carl had been paid off by Prince Damon to take Sir Lena's life. At the deceased knight's funeral, all grounds for reconciliation between Rhaenyra and Alicent's families were broken when their son's covert rivalry finally turned physical. Alicent's second son, Aemon, sneaked off into the night and claimed Lena's dragon Vagar as his steed, and was challenged by his nephews Jace, Luke, and Joff. The ensuing scuffle saw Aemon lose his eye to Luke's dagger after he provoked Rhaenyra's sons by calling them Strongs. When the court, gathered at high tide, had learned what happened, the aspiring first ladies of the realm went at each other's throats. Alicent demanded an eye for an eye, and Rhaenyra demanded that Aemon be questioned sharply about where he had heard such slanders against her sons. In the end, the king decreed that anyone who dared to talk of his grandson's claims being illegitimate would lose their tongues as payment, and forced yet another peace between the two sides, but blood had already been drawn. And if war was inevitable, then Rhaenyra was going to have her strongest possible general by her side at all times. Following the scandal that unfolded at high tide, Viserys commanded his daughter and her family to remain at Dragonstone and dismissed Sir Harwin from her service. When he and his father Lionel reached Harrenhal, they were burned to death in a mysterious fire whose source remains undetermined till this day. Many claim Prince Daemon was involved because of what happened next. Tired of having lost everyone she loved and held dear, Rhaenyra decided that she was going to take her fate in her own hands and made a very scandalous decision. She married her uncle Damon in secret, her second marriage and his third, less than six months after either of their spouses had died, and sealed it with a proper bedding for their first son, Aegon, was born that same year. Some say that the princess named her son so knowing that Alicent's firstborn was called Aegon as well, as an intentional slight to the Greens, and their queen treated it as such. Two years later, her second son by Damon, a boy they named Viserys, was born into the world and unlike all three of Rhaenyra's eldest. These two were model Valyrian children. And even though it was somewhat plain for all to see that Jace, Luke and Joff were all bastards, their father was dead so none could prove it conclusively, and those who hoped their dragon eggs would not hatch in their cradles were sorely disappointed. Out of the five children that Rhaenyra Targaryen birthed from her body, four became dragon riders, including her eldest son with Daemon. And in 127 AC, the Princess of Dragonstone got the opportunity to prove the Greens' inefficiency as rulers in person when she brought her own maester to the capital to save her father's life. In 126 AC, Rhaenyra's father by law, Corlys Valerian, fell grievously ill and it was feared that he might die. As a consequence, the question of Driftmark's succession arose and Rhaenyra put forth her own son Lucerys as a candidate. Since her eldest, Jace, was in line for the Iron Throne, Luke was the only viable choice for the next Lord of the Tides. But her request was challenged by the sea snake's nephew, Vaymond, who dared to call her children bastards. For that slight, Rhaenyra Targaryen had her husband strike his head off and had his carcass fed to her dragon Cyrax. All of Vaemon's relatives who escaped to King's Landing and brought their petitions to the king directly had their tongues removed. When Viserys made his proclamation, he slipped
stepped upon the Iron Throne and cut his hand to the bone. The wound got infected and the king too now suffered from a fever that could have been life-threatening. Nothing that Grand Maester Melos did could improve his condition. Then, Maester Garadis arrived and swiftly chopped off two of Viserys' fingers, thereby saving his life. It was this that drove the princess to suggest him as the next Grand Maester following Melos' death but facing pressure from Alicent. Viserys decreed that he would trust tradition instead and turn to the conclave of Archmaesters for the next Grand Maester. They dispatched Orwell to fill that post. In 129 AC, Rhaenyra became pregnant once again and was a month away from giving birth to her child when she received the news. The king was dead, and in his place, his firstborn son, Aegon, had been named the new king. The princess flew into a black rage that led to her labor coming on far earlier than anticipated. Daemon and Rhaenyra lost their child to stillbirth and deformity, but gained strength from their feelings of hatred and rage. The war that they had been anticipating for over a decade was finally at their doorstep, and they intended to greet it with fire and blood. The Black Queen, aka King Maegor with teats, Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen's reign. It is said that Rhaenyra Targaryen would wear her hair in a long, loose braid in the fashion of Queen Visenya Targaryen. With the knowledge of what unfolded during her reign, perhaps that should have been an indicator of things to come. The child that Rhaenyra was carrying in her womb but came out a twisted monstrosity was a girl she named Visenya, another ill omen. For the old queen and her son Maegor were basically taboo in Targaryen history by this point. Broken by her lost babe, Rhaenyra blamed it on the Greens and began plotting her own response. Because they received the news of Viserys' death before any loyalists could make their support for Rhaenyra known, the arrival of Sir Stephen Darklin of the Kingsguard was celebrated by those present at Dragonstone. The knight had brought with him the crown of King Jaehaerys and King Viserys after him, and with that Rhaenyra found the first symbol of legitimacy for her own claim. She was coroneted in a hastily arranged ceremony by her husband Prince Daemon, who proclaimed her Queen of the Seven Kingdoms and himself the Protector of the Realm. Rhaenyra named Sir Stephen the Lord commander of her Queensguard, which also included Sir Eric Cargill and Sir Laurent Marbrand, and declared her eldest son Jaceris, Prince of Dragonstone. The Black Council was joined by the immediate vassals of Dragonstone and the might of House Valerian, who declared for their daughter by law and were the first great house to do so. When word of Rhaenyra's claim reached King's Landing, emissaries were dispatched by King Aegon II with generous peace terms, but the Black Queen rejected them harshly. She snatched Grand Maester Orwell's chain of service and gave it to her own Maester Garadis, whom she proclaimed a more leal servant than him and the true Grand Maester of the realm. Rhaenyra sent him back empty-handed, but the absence of his chain of service spoke volumes. She had chosen war, and the Greens would have to prepare for it as well as they could. At the outbreak of the dance, the Greens outnumbered the Blacks in wealth and allies, but the latter outnumbered them with their dragons. Apart from three full-size battle-ready dragons in Caraxes, Cyrax, and Meles, they also had Vermax, Arax, Tyraxes, and Moondancer all of whom were said to be thriving and growing every year. The Blacks' location gave them a strategic advantage as they could easily blockade the gullet and cut off all trade with King's Landing, which they did, and the Dragonmont held six more wild dragons that they could have employed for their use at any time. Prince Damon suggested an immediate attack, highlighting the Rivalins as the key battleground of the war and suggesting an assault on Haddenhall led by him and Caraxes. While Rhaenyra assented to this plan, she also put into motion other diplomatic actions. At the suggestion of her son, Jace, Rhaenyra commissioned her eldest children to become her envoys, carrying her messages reminding the lords of the realm of their oaths on the back of their dragons. She sent Jace on the harder mission, making him treat with the Eyrie, the Three Sisters, White Harbor, and Winterfell, while she sent Luke on the presumably easier task of treating with Lord Boros Baratheon of Storm's End. The Storm Lords were tied to the Targaryens by blood and marriage, and Princess Rhaenys' own mother had been a Baratheon. Rhaenyra expected Luke's mission to be easier and safer, but made both her sons swear on the seven-pointed star to not pick a fight anyway. You can imagine her grief when she learned that the son she expected to face the least troubles was the one who ended up dying. Viserys' death shattered Rhaenyra. She gave over command of her war council to the Sea Snake and Rhaenys and retreated from the public eye. Not even Daemon's vengeance brought her comfort, for we do not know how she reacted. It was bitter irony then that the death of another son made her strong enough to start taking actions herself. 
Prince Gisaris Valerian stepped up to command his mother's council in the absence of both of his guardians and did the best job that a 14-year-old kid could do. He named his grandfather Hand and organized the defense of Dragonstone, even preparing for an assault on King's Landing after the sowing of the dragon seeds. But then her husband's old ghosts came back to haunt her sons, and Rhaenyra Targaryen was left with no other option but fire and blood. Her eldest son by Daemon, Aegon, arrived at Dragonstone on the back of his dying dragon to inform them all about the arrival of the Triarchy. Aegon's blood brother Viserys did not return with him, so everyone presumed the worst. During the Battle of the Gullet, Prince Viserys fought valiantly and brought down several Triarchy ships with Vermax, but the sailors had fought Caraxes in the Stepstones, and the Bloodworm was a far more formidable enemy. Both Viserys and Vermax died in the waters of the Gullet, and it was this loss that hardened the Black Queen into action. After learning of Aemond One-Eye and Kristen Cole's disastrous decision to march on Haddonhall, Rhaenyra named her third eldest son Joffrey, Prince of Dragonstone, and had her dragon riders, armies, and fleets focus on a direct assault on King's Landing. As soon as the Greens fighting forces were far away from home to not be able to make an effective retreat, the Blacks took the city and Rhaenyra Targaryen became the first person to call herself Queen in her own right to sit at the Iron Throne. She spent the better part of that night taking oaths of fealty from those in Aegon's court who would bend the knee, but instead of choosing the path that her father would have chosen, she took the path of her deceased daughter's namesake. When the realm's delight took the capital from her half-brother, she was welcomed as a liberator, for neither Aegon nor Aemond had been beloved of the small folk. But during the half-year of her reign, they went from calling her liberator to naming her King Magor, with teats. Death and taxes are the only two certainties of life, and the citizens of King's Landing learnt that lesson harshly during the reign of Rhaenyra Targaryen. Treachery had broken her heart too many times over for her to be anything but paranoid, and towards the end of her occupation, she began seeing traitors in every shadow. In the end, the city rose up against her, and she had to escape back to her seat, being forced to sell her father and great-grandfather's crown for safe passage. And even there, she was betrayed, for Dragonstone had been taken by forces loyal to King Aegon II by then. When Rhaenyra saw her half-brother's mangled body presiding over Dragonstone, she told him that she wished he were dead. Aegon replied that he would follow her to the grave, as she was the elder. What took place next is something Joffrey Baratheon told us all the way back in Season 3 of Game of Thrones. The king had his pretender sister fed to his dying dragon with her son Aegon watching in pure terror. Thus ended the life and times of Rhaenyra Targaryen, the half-year queen, the realm's delight in King Maegor with teats. Her reign is not even officially recognized as having taken place, given her sex, and she's remembered with grimness and distrust in the Seven Kingdoms. But this is not the Rhaenyra Targaryen you are guessing with House of the Dragon. But besides following the general outline of Fire and Blood's version of events, most things are different about her in the show. Split Legacy, Rhaenyra Targaryen in House of the Dragon and how her legacy will be split in the show. One of the biggest differences from book to show, if you haven't figured it out already, is Rhaenyra's relationship with her stepmom, Alicent Hightower. The friends turned enemies dynamic is a show exclusive thing only, and was necessary because, well, legal issues, but it does add another layer of depth to the overall story. By making Rhaenyra and Alicent not just two women vying to become the first lady of the realm, but also divided by a deep betrayal of each other's trust, makes it more than a simple petty power grab from an ambitious house. But what kind of detracts from the story for us is the fact that they're turning Rhaenyra into a clear Daenerys Targaryen parallel, and that is just not true. The Rhaenyra Targaryen in the books is very aware of her position and thrives in it. She often wears in purple and gold because Martin wants to symbolize just how pompous the princess is, and when she gets nervous or anxious, she begins twisting one of the many rings on her fingers made out of precious stones and metals alike. In the show, Rhaenyra not only dresses simple, but is fundamentally different because her actions don't make it seem as if she's wanting her privilege. Unlike what Alison says to Kristen Cole after the 10-year time skip, Rhaenyra Targaryen in Fire and Blood was not a woman bent on creating a new order, where women could inherit just like men. She was an exception, was aware of that fact, and intended to keep it that way. If she were truly concerned with revolutionizing the political system, she would have named Baylor Princess of Dragonstone after Jace's death, not Joffrey. Sure, Joff was her own flesh and blood, where Baylor was her adopted daughter from her second husband, but Daemon was Prince Constantine 
consort and both of his daughters were older than any of Rhaenyra's sons. By right, she should have named Baylor her heir if her fight was to change the system, but as the last few minutes might have clarified, that was never her goal. Rhaenyra Targaryen's ascent to the Iron Throne and subsequent deposition is a treatise in the hunger for power, lust for vengeance, participation in the Game of Thrones and all the consequences of those things. The show has made her a character who is relatable to the modern audience. When Leonor is proposed as her husband, she immediately agrees, as long as Otto is dismissed from his post. But the fact that her infamous comment about her half-brothers being more to Leonor's taste is proof of whitewashing. Even accepting the fact that Rhaenyra entertained Alicent's peace terms as a bit of a stretch, albeit one we can make given the relationship they spent the entire season setting up. We must mention here that Millie Alcock and Emma Darcy have done a brilliant job bringing the realm's delight to life. Two actresses nailing the same character is a rare occurrence, but then again, House of the Dragon is a rare show. What is going to be interesting, though, is to see how they handle Rhaenyra's history, because it appears as though they're going down the misunderstood ruler is remembered as tyrant path when that was kind of what she did in the books originally. Many characters speak of Rhaenyra Targaryen's reign in the main Song of Ice and Fire series, including characters like Ariane Martel and Aris Oakheart, but perhaps the best summation of her rule comes from the king in the north. Stannis Baratheon recalls to Davos Seaworth that traitors have always received a traitor's death and includes Rhaenyra in those ranks. He tells his Onion Knight that she was the daughter of one king and mother to two others, and yet she died a traitor's death for trying to usurp her brother's crown. The Baratheons had supported Aegon during the dance, so it is possible that Stannis is speaking with a family bias here. But he isn't the only one to hold this perception. Most scholars and nobles alike agree that the realm's delight turned out to be a cold-hearted tyrant. When Corlys Valerian preached the virtues of peace to the royal couple, Prince Daemon replied by saying that the war will be over when the heads of the traitors are on spikes above the king's gate and not before. Rhaenyra agreed with her husband. The show has done an admittedly great job of keeping her relatable and likable until the end of season one, and that is when we would like to hear your opinions about her real character. Rhaenyra Targaryen is coasting off the charm of Millie Alcock and Emma Darcy at the moment, but when her character unleashes fire and blood upon thousands of innocents, what excuse will her supporters have for supporting her? Sure, the Green started the war, but Rhaenyra's determination to end it is what saw the dragons die after the dance. The queen who sat the throne is bound to have a complicated legacy. And unlike Daenerys, whose story is still being written, she doesn't have the luxury of a what-if scenario. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.